Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you all here in Slovenia at this wonderful Congress Center at Bordeaux on what is a beautiful spring morning. It's a real joy, I think, for many of us coming from Brussels to finally see the sun again. So thank you very much to Slovenia for that. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure. Um, I have to say it's also very, very uh, exciting for us to be here. It's almost 10 years since we were last in uh, Slovenia uh, as Eurogas. So uh, a lot has changed in the energy uh, world since then. And we have a huge uh, variety of experts who will be speaking today about the topics we will cover, security of supply, and of course, transition. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to invite the opening speakers to come up and do the formal welcoming uh, on, on behalf of both Geoplin, our partner here in Slovenia, and Eurogas, our president, Didier Holde, will go after Matija. So Matija Patenk, the general manager of Geoplin, if you'd like to come up and give your speech, we'd be very happy to hear it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's uh, really a privilege to host Eurogas uh, annual regional conference again in Slovenia. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, our Minister for Energy, Environment uh, and Climate, Mr. Bojan Kumar, to take the time and be here with us today. I would also like to thank the representatives of European Commission, of the regulatory bodies in the region of TSOs, of our industry colleagues, uh, of our partners and customers. Last but not least, I would like to thank the organizational team uh, from Eurogas as well as from Geoplin for making such a nice weather and uh, bringing this conference to life. Uh, we live in a world where renewable energy, uh, sustainability, climate change, they are all buzzwords. We live uh, in time when we will strive to make our world a greener place. Uh, it's our responsibility to ourselves but also to future generations to do so. In this world, we strongly believe that natural gas has and will have an important role in the energy transition. Being the cleanest uh, fossil fuel, uh, being affordable, uh, is making it an uh, uh, unchangeable energy source for the midterm, and if you would like, this energy transition to be successful. Um, let's take some forecasts, let's put on some visionary goggles and see uh, what people think the future demand uh, for gas will be until 2050. If we can go to a picture. Uh -huh. Okay. So on this picture what we can see is that we have uh, as many scenarios as people in our room or even more probably. Um, but uh, still there are some takeaways. So the first takeaway is that the demand for na uh, natural gas will uh, be reduced slowly, gradually. Um, therefore, making investments in natural gas uh, to ensure the security of supply is still, and it will remain one of the key topics for the years to come. Even if we look at the green color where the identified potential fields are shown, we are not meeting the expected demand in more than half of the scenarios. So natural gas is here to stay. If we go to the second picture, from the global perspective to a more local perspective. Okay. Uh, we have uh, taken this out of the Slovene National Energy and Climate Plan until 2040, the la latest proposal. Uh, what we can see is the demand for natural gas, including uh, the, the biogas, will be more or less stable throughout the period until 2040, or even the fact within this period until 2035, we can expect the demand for natural gas will grow. Uh, why is that so? It's because uh, natural gas is the best alternative to using coal. And in the process of energy transition, uh, Slovenia has a good opportunity to make these steps with a known technology, which is natural gas. Uh, you can see here on the slide, so scenario one represents current measures, scenario two, huge increase in renewables, 
and scenario three adds on top the nuclear. So in all the scenarios, still the demand for natural gas will be here to stay, not only short term, but mid to long term. So it's a very relevant topic, global wise, and also on the regional level or local level. Uh, what we have to acknowledge uh, is the fact that the role of natural gas will change in the future. Uh, we believe that it will not represent the base load or the primary source of energy throughout the entire time, uh, but it, uh, its role will change towards uh, being the best uh, alternative for managing the flexibility of the uh, electricity grid. We know that with renewables, with wind, with solar, wind stops blowing, sun turns out, um, we have to manage these peaks and volatility and natural gas or the molecules are best fit for doing that purpose. Uh, so to sum it up, the role of natural gas within the energy system in the future will be different, but nevertheless it will be very important. Therefore, our task is to look for and implement ways to make our gas grid greener. And that's a commitment of all of us and it will affect each and every one of us sitting in this room and wider. Therefore, investments and strategies need to be employed to support the role of natural gas in the energy system from at least mid-term, but I believe also long-term perspective. We believe that only through cooperation between governments, the industry and consumers can the formulation of policies and strategy for a decarbonized future be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matea, and also thanks very much for the uh, detailed insight into the Slovenian gas market in the future. Uh, we are very strongly interested in that. Without further ado, Didier, I would like to ask you to take the, uh, the floor. And uh, indeed, we are very interested to hear the European perspective. Good morning to all. Um, and first, I would like to uh, wish a very warm welcome to all participants and uh, particularly to uh, the Minister Boyan Kumer, to the Member of European Parliament uh, Frank Bokovic, and to the Commission Head of Unit uh, Monika, uh, Monika Sigiri. Um, we are very honored to have you here, but we are also very honored to have all our colleagues in the room. We are pleased to be in Slovenia because um, also uh, we have to look at the gas market from a global European perspective. It becomes particularly relevant when you discuss policy and how to implement them to go on the ground in different countries and see how things happen. And particularly in the light of the recently adopted uh, directive and regulation on the gas and hydrogen package. Uh, gas and hydrogen package set targets globally for Europe, but we have to look at how to implement them in uh, different regions. And in this particular case um, of implementing gas and hydrogen package in Slovenia and in this, uh, this part of Europe, I would like to give you two um, messages, two lessons I have learned throughout my uh, something like 30 years in the gas industry. The first one is that molecule gas is essential in any energy system. And because it's essential, we need to find a way, as Matija has said, to have green gas in the future. And when it comes to Slovenia, you may have a limited potential in biomethane, which doesn't mean that you don't have to develop this potential, and that's the first step. But more and more in different parts of Europe, people are considering me me making synthetic gas out of waste, be it dry waste that you can transform through pure gasification, or be it wet waste that you can transform through hydrothermal gasification. So that's also something that you should consider. By the way, it allows us to get rid of some plastics that nobody knows how, what to do with, and, and get gas which is valuable in exchange. 
And obviously also hydrogen is part of the future uh, renewable gas um, development. Um, and by looking at all possible resources for renewable gas, I'm sure that Slovenia will find a way to have 100% green gas in the very long term future. The second message is when you look at this, you need to take a systematic view. You take the full gas chain from supply down to uh, final use, including transportation, including storage, including distribution, and so on, to make sure that the view you take on the future of gas is consistent. And I would like just to emphasize the fact that storage is a particularly important break because one of the main advantages of having gas in an energy system is that you can store it and use it at peak time. So these are the two messages I wanted to give you inspired by my experience, but then I will leave the floor to people who know better than I do the Slovenian case and how to, uh, how to develop it. And uh, therefore, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing the debates around these points. And I would like to finish just by thanking our colleagues uh, uh, in uh, Joplin and uh, Matija is one of our board members in Eurogas for organizing this conference with us. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Didier. Indeed, we are meeting in the shadow of the agreement of the new gas and hydrogen package, and there is much to think about, and also the impacts in the mid to long term on Slovenia. And uh, somebody who probably has that very close to his heart is uh, the Minister for the Environment of Climate and Energy, Bojan Kuma, who we are very honoured to have with us today, and we now give you the floor. Thank you very much. President Olo, Mr. Bittens, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to address you today at the Eurogas Annual Regional Conference. Let me first thank uh, Eurogas and Geoplin to organizing uh, today's conference, which provides a great opportunity to discuss the most pressing issues in the gas sector. I strongly believe in the need for uh, robust gas systems ready for energy transition and transformation to a truly green economy. The gas sector in the EU is facing historic challenges. On the one hand, we are striving to ensure a reliable gas supply in the wake of growing geopolitical tension. On the other hand, we are undertaking massive investments in the energy transition, including the accelerated phase out of fossil fuels. The Russian aggression in Ukraine has profoundly changed the EU energy landscape. In the short run, Diversifying our energy sources away from Russian natural gas will be key to ensure energy, EU energy security. This is extremely important as natural gas still plays a central role in today's society and economy. It is currently one of the key energy sources for industry, for example, in production of fertilizers and for the chemical industry. In some cases, it also remains a key fuel for balancing our electricity grids. On top of that, it remains an important bridge fuel on our path to climate neutrality, particularly in replacing the use of coal. Both the EU and Slovenia are actively diversifying their gas supplies while relentlessly working on strengthened interconnections with our neighbors. We need all of this in order to keep our economies strong and rely to finance the green transition. It is therefore necessary to ensure a reliable supply of gas, both in terms of infrastructure and gas sources. Before the conflict in Ukraine, there was skepticism surrounding uh, investments in new gas infrastructure. Many 
regarded such investment as further support for fossil fuels. However, the landscape has shifted. It is now evident that the enhancing our infrastructure serves a dual purpose, securing alternative gas flows and facilitating the adoption of hydrogen and other renewable and low carbon gases. This brings me to the long-term importance of green and low carbon gases. They offer a great opportunity to decarbonize sectors where electrification is not the most suitable option. Considering the existing level of uh, attention and interest, we can only expect that even more investment will flow towards the production and offtake of green and low carbon gases. To sum up, we are faced with two major tasks. We need to ensure an adequate supply of natural gas while also promoting the uptake of renewable and low carbon energy sources. Given the scale of scope of these challenges, I hope that today's discussions can shed light particularly on the different market players' visions and plans. It would be interesting to hear what obstacles you are facing and what more could be done by governments. Is the agreed gas package a solid enough foundation for future investments? Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to actively engage in a constructive debate and use this opportunity for fruitful exchanges and new connections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And uh, we take uh, great pleasure uh, from the positivity uh, that you mentioned about the needs for investments in the next generation of gases, the green gases that we see that will be inevitably used across Europe, but also here in Slovenia. Uh, and indeed, we also took note about the points you made about security of supply. Uh, that is indeed very important for the current uh, situation. And we are still grappling with the aftermath of the uh, war of Ukraine. And I will move to the next speaker because uh, this is somebody who has been personally grappling with that aftermath. Uh, she is now uh, the head of the Energy Security and Safety Division in the B unit of uh, DGNA, but has until very recently been working very closely with Eurogas on uh, demand aggregation and security for supply, and as the minister said, diversification, which is a huge, huge issue for us. So Monica, Monica Ziguri, we're very happy to have you with us today, and we're very interested to hear your points of view, and congratulations on your new post. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I usually make Eurogas happy with all the stuff that we do at the Commission. Uh, I wouldn't say that they are always smiling. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, really, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, a bit uh, focus on what the EU uh, has done or has been doing or is planning to do and see um, uh, how specifically in this region the potentials or the challenges can be, uh, can be faced. Um, just before going into the topics, uh, it is um, a, a specifically interesting uh, um, place to be. Uh, this region, uh, Slovenia included, this South, uh, Central European region, uh, has been one of the um, uh, very great examples of regional cooperation in the, in the field of energy. Uh, dec decades ago, uh, we have started the North-South interconnections for gas and for electricity. Uh, this has moved uh, into the, uh, the SESE group, um, uh, as well as uh, risk groups or security of supply focus groups, also specifically um, in the region. And also the SESE group, whilst it started from gas, it has now extended its scope uh, into renewables, into supporting the energy transition and looking into the, uh, the specific challenges um, uh, in this region. So what I would like to, uh, uh, th there are three points that I would like to touch upon uh, today. One of them is the European Green Deal uh, and the question whether it is something that we started a few years ago and now it's completely off course or not. Second, obviously, uh, there is still a war raging uh, next to us and while uh, the, uh, the, the crisis that it, uh, energy crisis that it has uh, triggered uh, is slowing down, or at least it's now seems to be manageable. We still need to uh, see 
uh, what the impact uh, of that had and whether it is still fits uh, with our objectives of uh, decarbonization. And my third point would be focusing on then how critical the next decade uh, will be and in which direction we actually uh, start. So let me start with the, um, with the Green Deal. It's the top priority of the Commission since 20, uh, 2019 uh, and it has its commitment to, uh, to a climate neutral uh, future by uh, 2050. Uh, with a, um, we also set targets for 2030 when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions of uh, reducing it by 55%. Uh, and very recently, we have also come up uh, with options in terms of pathways on how to get to this 2050, because those can be very different. Um, and therefore, we also saw, uh, saw the potential for 2040 uh, to reach 90% uh, of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. But whichever pathway uh, we take, what we also recognized uh, is that uh, industrial carbon management uh, um, will be important, which would also include uh, a, a, co a comprehensive framework for CCS, CCU, and this is something which is quite relevant uh, for, the, uh, for the gas industry. Um, it was already, already mentioned, the decarbonization and hydrogen package sets the framework, the regulatory framework, uh, in order to build up uh, and support the, uh, the, the management and the diversification of the types of gases that we can have in the system, because I do agree gas as such is something that, uh, that an energy mix cannot really live without uh, because of this, uh, its, its uh, characteristics. Here, I think uh, you've also heard about the methane regulation, which also uh, has uh, its contribution or tries to contribute uh, to the, uh, the slow uh, gradual decarbonization uh, of the system. Uh, this new regulatory framework for um, hydrogen and, and gases, it also provides a legal certainty, a bit of a more long-term visibility on how the framework would be, and these are all, 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 um, always important for investments. Uh, companies, those doing the investment and deciding on those investments need uh, this longer term um, visibility. And this regulatory framework practically complements now the already existing infrastructure framework under the 10E, uh, where in, uh, in November 2023, the first uh, PCI list, uh, including hydrogen related infrastructure has been uh, approved. Uh, and it is not only gas infrastructure, but uh, uh, in, in, in fact, also electrolyzers uh, have been part of this, uh, of this um, uh, list. Uh, I would also, uh, well, there are many other topics that I could uh, also bring up here, but probably uh, this is sufficient uh, on the European Green Deal. But uh, just to see whether with the, uh, with the crisis that we have, uh, we have gone through uh, lately, um, I think the, 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 the energy crisis triggered, so, uh, triggered and accelerated uh, all the, the, the activities that uh, moved towards decarbonization. Energy policy has its three pillars, which we always think, and probably sometimes we are right, they are not completely um, in synergy. So we do have uh, competitiveness, uh, sustainability, um, um, as well as uh, security of supply, and these do not always uh, uh, are in par. Security of supply always uh, is picked up uh, following crisis. Somehow this is what happened since uh, 2008 probably is when the, the first bigger crisis happened, and then in between this crisis we just forget about it. Um, then we do have uh, sustainability, and that also uh, is brought up uh, on a regular basis. But this is the time, the first time, that uh, as follow-up to the crisis, uh, while energy security has come to the fore, we use that uh, as a momentum to, to accelerate the energy transition. But at the same time, we realize that competitiveness is being hurt. Uh, so this is the time that these three somehow need to be uh, put uh, back in balance. So what has the, uh, as a response to the crisis, we had demand reduction that was quite significant, 19% uh, of less gas has been consumed, and between 2022 uh, and uh, January, February 2023, uh, the amount of, uh, of demand reduction was equivalent to 106 PCMs of gas. Uh, we accelerated renewables deployment, solar, wind, 
uh, and all the and uh, in 22 uh, the increased investments were about 50 percent higher than the year before. Even in 23 they were 30 percent higher, and altogether uh, these uh, these investments ma uh, managed to replace around 11 BCM of gas. Uh, and those renewables will be working on from now on. So it is not something that uh, we will lose um, in, the, um, in the long term. Um, in terms of diversification, it was already mentioned, the, uh, we managed to uh, increase the, even the pipeline imports from alternative uh, suppliers to an extent, but obviously those have its limitations. So the biggest diversification source was LNG, uh, and also within uh, LNG, it was US LNG, uh, that has been increasing, and here the numbers are also quite significant from 68 BCM uh, of LNG coming to Europe in 21. Uh, in 22, it was already 118, and in 2023, 123 uh, BCM. Today, gas prices are quite close to pre-crisis uh, levels, but they are still, uh, kind of, I would say, the market is still very tight or nervous, Anything happens in Australia uh, and, uh, or, or somewhere else um, does have an impact on, on, on these gas prices. So we have to be uh, quite, uh, so cannot be fully uh, complacent. And this is why we need to continue monitoring uh, the, uh, the situation, and this is also why the demand reduction, while not in the form of a regulation, but as a council recommendation, continues to be, uh, continues to be in place. Because without the demand side, the demand side, demand supply is a balance, so if we don't get more supplies, we do have to look at what we can do on the demand side. So the demand side does have a, an important role to play in, in security of supply. And with that, I would like to get, get, go to my, uh, arrive to my third point. Uh, so in order to close this circle of energy security, sustainability, on energy transition and competitiveness, um, back in, in, Feb well, in February 2023, uh, the Commission announced the Green Deal Industrial Plan, uh, and this is what provides a clear strategy uh, for a global competitiveness uh, of our clean tech uh, industry. Uh, and supporting the supply chains that are needed for the energy transition. Um, also, when it comes to the, uh, the next, uh, next decade, in order to achieve our climate goals, as I said, this is a, a critical, uh, critical period. And when it comes to security of supply, changes, uh, there will be many changes, there will be drastic systemic uh, changes, and we don't really know for sure what those changes will be. So the security of supply framework needs to be quite dynamic and needs to be rethought so that it can accompany this energy transition so that prices do not go, go uh, up through the roof again. And with that, we can also uh, make sure that the energy transition doesn't come at the cost of industrial competitiveness uh, in the EU. And with that, I would like to thank for your uh, attention, and I'm sure that the discussions uh, following uh, the, the, pr the first part of the program will be uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, and indeed, I think we can honestly say we take a great uh, heart in the point that you make that you agree that indeed uh, gaseous molecules will be necessary as we go forward. Uh, I think you also reminded us very well how energetic uh, you have been in the last few years with so many different initiatives, uh, CCS, methane regulation, hydrogen, gas package, plus all of the work around the uh, joint purchasing. It's been a, indeed a very busy time. Uh, and thinking of that, of course, uh, another person who's been working very much in the uh, heart of the European uh, institutions uh, is MEP Frank Bogovic, a member of the European Parliament. We've had a lot of things to say, and I did probably are very interested in the final part that you made about competitiveness. How do we maintain uh, a competitive industry, prices for consumers at this time when we're seeking for diversification but also decarbonisation? Uh, MEP Frank Bogovic, delighted to have you with us this morning. The floor is yours. Uh, morning to everybody, dear representatives of Eurogas, uh, dear representative of Geoplin, uh, dear Minister Boyan Kumer, uh, dear Monica Zigri. Welcome here in Congress Center, Bordo. As you see, the energy in Slovenia is good. Uh, at least weather is much better than in Brussels, where I'm very often. So 
welcome in this, on this uh, sunny side of uh, Alps, as we uh, like to say, in, uh, welcome in, in uh, Slovenia. It's, uh, I'm really deeply honored uh, to be invited to this year's uh, Eurogas Regional Conference here in Bordeaux, and as a member of uh, <coughs> European Parliament ITRE Committee, and a former long-standing mayor of the Kersko municipality, the only Slovenian municipality with nuclear po power plant, I'm very closely connected to energy policy and its developments in recent years, I can say decades because I was elected in previous century. So <laughs> I'm really close to this uh, quite long time. Uh, today uh, we stand uh, at a crossroad in our journey towards sustainable and resilient energy future. As we navigate uh, through the complexities uh, of energy transition, it's imperative that our path is not only ambition, uh, is not only ambitious, but fair, both to citizens and economy as a whole. The challenge before is us is monumental. Our mission to decarbonize the European economy, as outlined in the European Green Deal and Repower EU plans, is both urgent and necessary. In this context, uh, the role of gas, both conventional and renewable, is and remains important. Our approach towards the use of gas in our decarbonization efforts must therefore be guided by principle of technological neutrality. You remember the debate about uh, taxonomy. Also, you remember, or all we know, that the war in Ukraine is game changer for many things. I think that also for Green Deal uh, vision, and uh, so we are really in challenging time. As already mentioned by my previous speakers, uh, the gas package marks a significant step forward by fostering the development of new gases like biomethane and hydrogen. This legislation is not merely a policy tool, it's a catalyst for innovation and, for innovation and sustainability. These gases are not optional extras in our climate strategy, they are indispensable. Uh, they will not only help us to meet uh, our ambitious climate targets, but will also ensure that our industries remain competitive and sustainable. The inclusion of biomethane bio and hydrogen in our energy mix is a proof of our commitment to technology, technological, technologically neutral, neutral approach, which recognizes the value of all solutions in achieving sustainability. When discussing our energy needs, we must also have in mind the competitiveness of our economy and industry in particular. After the start of the Russian war uh, of uh, aggression in Ukraine, uh, the sudden demand for supplies, mostly from uh, the global LNG market, came in an enormous cost for European economies. In 2022, the average wholesale price in Europe were 100 uh, free euro per megawatt hour, compared with 32 megawatt hour, uh, euro per megawatt hour in Asia and only 19 euro per megawatt hour in North America. Subsequently, the EU in 22 paid an estimated additional 250 billion euro for gas demand compared to what would be paid with 21 price level. Europe, uh, Europe's overall demand of natural gas dropped for 13%. But at the same time, the import of LNG grow for 60%. According to estimation, the European Central Bank, the supply shock contributed to 2.8 trillion of lost GDP growth in the EU alone between 22 and 28. Although gas prices are now at the pre-crisis pre level, Europe's industry is still pay, paying around five times more compared to our competitors across the ocean and in Asia. LNG imports will therefore, uh, will therefore uh, crucial for ba balancing Europe's market in our, and our economy. For now, Europe's buyer, Europe, European buyers secured uh, free, 339 uh, BCM of LNG, while Asian buyers secured 730 BCM of LNG more than twice, twice uh, as much. Securing additional 600 BCM of LNG, what we would need until 2027, will therefore be an enormous challenge in volatile global LNG market. 
Our journey towards a fully renewable energy system will therefore be gradual. In this transition, natural gas plays a crucial role. It is pragmatic to acknowledge that we will rely on natural gas for some times to come. As transition fuel, it has a potential to make an energy transition more affordable and feasible, ensuring that no member of our society is left behind, that our industry remains competitive, and that we do not push our citizens into energy poverty. This is not a compromise at the expense of the environment, but a strategic step in our broader vision for a clean energy future. Moreover, our efforts to reduce the environmental impact on our energy consumption do not stop at diversifying our energy sources. Technologies like carbon capture and storage, CCS, are vital in our fight against climate change. CCS represents a bridge between our present reliance on fossil fuels and our future of net zero emissions. The progress made in reducing methane emissions is equally important. Methane has a significant impact on global warming and our effort to curb its release and, and uh, are crucial for both our climate targets and for the air quality. In conclusion, our path to way <coughs> requires a balanced and pragmatic approach. We must harness the potential of new gases, continue to use gas, uh, natural gas responsibly as transition fuel, and invest in technologies that reduce the environmental impact of our energy consumption. It's not just about meeting targets. It's about creating a sustainable future that benefits every citizen, every industry, and every member state. Uh, I want that after this conference that it will be more predictable for our sector and I wish that uh, uh, there will be less scenarios and you, as you presented at the beginning and that will give the base for, uh, for um, uh, sign the new contract uh, for gas for the Europe, what is necessary if you want to have a stable, uh, stable environment in, in, Euro in Europe. Thanks a lot for listening and I wish you a nice day here in Slovenia and uh, thanks again that uh, this regional conference is in Slovenia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, greatly appreciated the way that you described the role of natural gas as that step going forward to achieve uh, climate objectives. Indeed, it's not just about targets, it is about communities, it is about people, and that is the end, uh, the basis of politics, and of course all of the work that we do in the energy sector, which in the end is about dealing with customers. I really uh, thank all of the uh, opening speakers because I think they've really laid a very strong foundation uh, for the discussions that will follow. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, all the issues that we will look at, securing gas supply and the transition towards decarbonization, every speaker has mentioned this. This is the indeed the cosm that we are standing in, that we have to find the right way forward to keep society moving in the right direction in terms of supporting the Green, tran uh, the green Deal and the Green Transition, but also making sure we have competitive uh, gas and gas supply. And I suppose uh, I will say one final thing. We are always in the gas industry determined to make sure that we are bringing in gas at the best prices for everyone. We are in a very, un uh, very unique situation since the war in Ukraine, and of course, security supply is the top uh, concern for us. We are always one uh, potential incident away from having another issue. So we can't be too satisfied with the situation as we see. We will need to continue working on securing gas supply, which I think indeed, uh, MEP Bogvich, you, you pointed out very well. My uh, entertainment for myself, giving me the opportunity to speak, is coming to an end. Uh, I have to say I always uh, regret this moment in the conference, but the rest of the morning you'll be in much more professional hands than mine uh, because I'm very happy to say that we have uh, Igor E. Bergant, uh, journalist and TV host here from Slovenia, who'll be leading the proceedings for the rest of the morning. So please join me in welcoming him and uh, thank you for humouring me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're talking a lot about uh, the weather, English habits, but we'll stick to the region actually in the, in the, uh, in the uh, two panels uh, to come. Uh, we'll start now with the first panel uh, on securing gas supply for Slovenia and the region. I'm really happy to announce uh, the panelists, Mrs. Clara Poletti, Chair of the Board of Regulators at Acer. We'll take ladies uh, in the middle. So welcome. Uh, then Mrs. Bojana Achowski, Secretary General of Gas Infrastructure uh, Europe. 
Then from uh, Croatia, we have Mr. Ivan Fugash, Managing Director of LNG uh, Croatia. And from Slovenia, Mr. Metod Podkrižnik, member of the management board of the Petrol Group. So well, uh, ah. I'll take the edge. Uh, Hello. So, so uh, welcome all. Uh, in the coming 50 minutes, we would like to uh, discuss uh, the security of uh, gas supply, the current situation, and of course, uh, and of course, the uh, perspectives. Uh, we also encourage the the audience to take part in the questions and answers uh, <coughs> section. We will start in, in about uh, 25 minutes. But, but let us go with the Slovenian habit of, of uh, ladies uh, first. Um, about how, how you see from your uh, positions uh, the current situation in Slovenia and in the region, Mrs. Mrs. Poletti, um, you are commissioner of the Italian Independent Regulatory Authority for Energy uh, Networks and Environment, the so-called ARERA, but you're, you're, of course, also the chair of the board of regulators of the European Agency for Cooperation of Energy Regulators, ACERS, uh, which uh, is based in Slovenia. So from both your uh, perspectives, how do you see the current situation in Slovenia and, and the region? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a very great location and uh, the topic uh, is, is so important. Uh, the, uh, this region is one, and, and Slovenia, but the old region, is one of the regions where we are experiencing the most relevant and rapid um, changes uh, to secure uh, our energy sources uh, given uh, the current uh, geopolitical situation. So uh, there is no doubt that Slovenia has, uh, and the old region uh, uh, has a lot to do, and, they, and things are actually progressing. Uh, a lot of new um, infrastructural developments to uh, increase the, the energy portfolio and to get new sources with the, uh, the new LNG, the increase in the LNG capacity in Croatia, uh, the uh, development of the new gas field uh, in uh, the Black Sea, uh, and uh, the additional uh, LNG uh, in, uh, in Greece, for example, but that's not enough. Of course, you have to connect the new sources, so you need to better integrate the region. And that's uh, uh, as much as uh, the region is doing in order to uh, um, better uh, to create the conditions uh, to, uh, to let the gas flow. But that's not enough. That's the, my first message is investing and uh, having uh, the infrastructures in place is not enough. We need to have a proper regulatory framework uh, to improve and to make sure that the, those infrastructures are efficiently used for the benefit of all the region and all Europe, I would say. Um, so, for example, reverse flow is, is very important and making the infrastructures more flexible, but even uh, uh, making sure that the um, um, great uh, storage capacities in uh, Ukraine uh, are, uh, uh, can be used for the benefit of the region. And uh, if we um, talk about storage, this is something has already been mentioned. I think one of the uh, main lesson learned from the energy crisis has been the role of storage for security of supply. We have been living for a while, for a few years, in a world where we thought and we regulated storage as if the storage capacity was uh, meant only to support market functioning. But actually, we, uh, I think everybody is now uh, aware that storage has an intrinsic value for security of supply. And, and probably the discussion on how to regulate storage to make sure that the value, that value is taken into account is still at early stages because we had to intervene in emergency. But now I think we need to sit down and, and uh, properly think on how we want to uh, go forward for the future and we need uh, the way the uh, each gas system will implement uh, the measures to reach the filling targets will be relevant and will be very important for our market functioning again because there are a lot of externalities and we need to make sure that uh, for example in this region there are 
systems that have uh, excess capacity compared to their domestic needs. So we have to make sure that those excess capacities are made available to uh, the uh, other countries and other systems. And that, but that's not easy because there is always... The, here we are talking about security of supply, so there is always uh, a balance to be found. Um, how much risk can I take at home? Uh, and I think for sure uh, the uh, agreements for a solidar the solidarity agreements are important, but I, I think they are not enough. We need to really to devise our regulation in such a way as to consider security supply uh, since the beginning in our standard regulatory uh, framework. Um, another, uh, I think, another important uh, um, uh, lesson learned from uh, the crisis is that market integration is key to ensure security of supply. So closing, uh, closing the frontiers uh, could be very, very dangerous and it's a big temptation. I think we, we've seen it. It's very easy. Uh, it's a, is an easy somehow way out to say, okay, I have something and keep it for myself. Uh, and maybe the, that c could be done in some instances from using unilateral measures from um, uh, single um, countries uh, to reduce or to stop uh, cross-border exchanges. And that's something we should really avoid. It's important that we keep a unified market because overall we are going all to be better off in the future if we manage to, to work together. Uh, of course, um, uh, green gases and, and the transition uh, and, uh, um, and the sustainability, they have to work uh, together, uh, together with competitiveness. Uh, uh, a lot has already been said. We have a huge uncertainty for the future, a lot of scenarios, and it's a time where I think institutions and operators, they all need to sit, and university and research players, they, we need all to sit together. It's time for cooperation, it's time for discussion, uh, and uh, um, even in the implementing the uh, gas decarbonization package, I think we, sh we need really to keep this cooperative approach, horizontal cooperative approach. So, so to paraphrase a little bit of the famous uh, phrase, um, trust is good, uh, but um, control is better. We could say, well, solidarity is, is uh, good, regulation is better, but cooperation is the best. Well, we'll come to that when, when it comes to, uh, to, to the future prospects. And now to the view of the uh, Gas Infrastructure Europe, uh, which is the European Association of Infrastructure Operators for Renewable, Low Carbon and Natural uh, gases including hydrogen and uh, biomethane. Uh, Mrs. Archowski, what is your view on the current situation and, and what, what, happened, what has happened um, in, in recent years in the region? Indeed. Um, first, thank you for the invitation to, to Eurogas. Uh, very happy to, to be here. I'm also coming from the region. I'm Bulgarian, so for me the topic is, uh, is very interesting and very important. I have been uh, there in the Bulgarian transmission system operator, Bulgar Transgas, when the, mm -hmm. the crisis started already a long time ago, in 2008 and 2009. Um, so have some, some good memories of, uh, let's say, the achievements which were done on the interconnectivity perspective. We're not short of crisis, uh, apparently. Um, <laughs> so um, I represent indeed the European gas infrastructure um, and basically think of us as a tool, of a uh, very resilient tool of uh, decarbonization and a tool, a uh, very sustainable tool, which uh, transport and store and import a very large amount of energy. Uh, of course, natural gas, uh, low carbon gases, um, and in the future, biomethane and hydrogen. And of course, a very resilient tool for providing security of supply, which we actually do, do the best. Um, so, I would like to, to follow Clara's approach of, of putting key messages, so I will do it in three perspectives. First, when we talk about decarbonization, for sure we need to, to bear in mind that decarbonization goes very much hand by hand by security of supply, making sure, let's say, that this process is not let, left behind, right? Because 
Sometimes we have the feeling that uh, um, ensuring security of supply is something that is received for given, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. And is the region actually coping with, with this approach? Um, well, we are finding ourselves in a times in a crisis. Um, we started already more than two years ago, yeah. and then also with, with the war that started, indeed, we faced an increased, um, let's say, turbulences within the system, witness shifts in gas flow and rapid capacity expansion, but I think that uh, the system that we operated shows very much that is very resilient. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, indeed, we should not underestimate the role of the gas storage and the investments which were put, uh, which, were, which were done in these regards are extremely, extremely paramount. So, the targets which were put forward by the European Commission when, when the, the war started, indeed, in Repower EU, the European uh, underground storage operators, we showcase very efficiently that we reached even before the mm -hmm. timing when, uh, when they were put. Very proud of that, by the way, in the, in the past uh, two years. The third thing, of course, is the important role of the, of the import terminals. And here, indeed, the increased amount and efforts of investing in LNG terminals and also FSRUs. I mean, there are many countries, and, and uh, Clara mentioned some of them, and indeed also Germany is a good example on that, on how fast, where there is a political will, mm -hmm. things can happen. And all of these showcase that, indeed, when you have a situation, the European gas infrastructure operators are very much willing to, to react fast. And I think that the crisis actually was managed very well, not without our efforts. The second thing, it's uh, very much important to say that our role does not end here, not only security spread, right? So we see an enormous um, efforts indeed on increasing, let's say, the, the, the role of the renewables and the willingness of achieving a climate neutral economy. And indeed for the region, as we've heard, and I, I truly resonate uh, with that as a, as a person coming from the region, I'm from Bulgaria, the role of the natural gas for this transitional period is extremely important and we should not underestimate it. Although, as I mentioned, the infrastructure is going to be extremely able and available mm. actually for this decarbonization process. There is a lot of investments which are done in these regards. Indeed, uh, low carbon gases is something that you know, we are able to, to, to transport, to store, but also in future the role of biomethane and hydrogen is something mm -hmm. that uh, indeed uh, is within the agenda and we are doing enormous investments in these regards. Of course, we see that the need of you know, when we are talking about decarbonization, the need of securing a very proper investments and development in the electricity uh, network, when we're talking about uh, renewable electricity, you should make sure that in parallel you secure mm -hmm. a very robust um, infrastructure also for low carbon gases and renewable gases. So indeed, in the infrastructure, the role of, uh, of clean molecules and electrons should come in parallel. So a very good uh, a dance among, mm -hmm. among these two infrastructure, which could uh, work in parallel very properly to mm -hmm. provide this very big uh, um, security of, of, the, of the systems, and especially when we talk about renewable electricity. And those are indeed the, 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 current, uh, the current reports that we are seeing. It's, it's very important to, in these regards, uh, that we see, for example, the role of, uh, of uh, hydrogen storages and indeed mm -hmm. the planning and the projections of the development of the infrastructure. And the third message, the last one, is indeed that upcoming elections are coming. I mean, are coming ahead. Uh, we know that... Uh, you don't mean American elections? No, European, actually, yeah. in uh, those in 9th of June. <laughs> so um, it was an interesting figure that was prepared by, by my team, which it seems that 45% of the population, uh, the rural population, actually, is going to mm -hmm. this election, so a very key one. And um, as this is happening and uh, some new policymakers are going to, to come, 
in place, we need to make sure that there is indeed a con continuation of the efforts mm -hmm. or the discussions that we were very much engaged in the past two years with hydrogen and gas package mm -hmm. to make sure that implementation fa uh, phase is, uh, is secured and is very proper because indeed it is a huge difference between member states to member states oh, yeah. on the implementation um, even in regards to, to achieving the Green Deal uh, a kind of milestones, but to make sure that there is a kind of a coordinated approach here in the European level, so I agree on that, and also to make sure that, uh, well, they realize that there is no one-size-fits-all solution, and to make sure that there's differences between uh, mm -hmm. the countries, and especially in regional perspectives, are properly taken into account. So. Three things, decarbonization and security of supply goes hand by hand. Then the role of, uh, of uh, the, let's say, the, the infrastructure that has to play, that should be together in parallel with, uh, with the electricity system. And of course, making sure that there is a very proper implementation of mm -hmm. this uh, intention that was set by, by the packages. Great. Mr. Fugas, speaking of election, Croatia will have also a parliamentary election. Uh, in, in late late spring, but we will, we will not discuss this. Uh, now we will discuss uh, your LNG terminal in Kirk, uh, which was actually mentioned um, uh, also by, by uh, uh, previous uh, speakers. Uh, Slovenia is a mountainous country. We can actually see it from, from the Slovenian-Croatian border, from the Slovenian mountains to the LNG terminal. Sometimes we said, hmm, but now we say, oh, I mean, uh, is, <laughs> w w would you say that, that, that your LNG terminal is, let's say, one of the winners of, of the recent crisis? Uh, not only you, uh, greetings to all, sorry. Uh, not only you are, were saying that you were against LNG terminal, everybody was against LNG terminal, especially in 2019, I think. Mm -hmm. We had big protests and everybody was saying that it's basically a nuclear bomb on the, on the Kirk end. But in 2021, the story changed. And unfortunately, because of this war situation, especially now, the terminal is a major energy point in this part of Europe, mm -hmm. and everybody wants to be the user of the terminal. And that is the reason, of course, why we decided to increase the capacity of the terminal. And uh, also, I would not say that the terminal is a winner here. Um, I think that Croatia and also the other countries in the region are also the winner because of this uh, terminal. Mm -hmm. Now, the, everybody is saying, I mean, like I said, everybody was against the terminal, but then, now they are saying, why didn't we buy a larger ship and okay. why are we not use, doing the more regasification? So you can never satisfy everybody. Okay, I mean, uh, it, it's interesting because uh, in the time when LNG uh, terminal um, became, let's say, a, a love affair of, of, of the Star Wars, you became the general manager, so it's, it's, it's a very fitting, uh, fitting time. But w w um, we will talk about, let's say, regional challenges later on, but would you say that you, you cope now with the love you, you get from, uh, from, from your environment? Well, probably, yeah. yeah. I can say, I mean, in the beginning, every, everything was wow, you know, because, uh, like I said, the story changed in just a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And now when you see that when we are telling to everybody or to any potential user that we are completely sold out up to 2037, mm -hmm. they were all like, wow, how, how is that possible? But it is. <coughs> and now when we are completely sold out, now we were like, Okay, now we can't, sorry, screw something up. So it, it is what it is, I mean. Okay, we, we, we will speak about the prospects later. I'll just like to challenge Mr. Podkriznik. Uh, well, your group is based, uh, based in Slovenia, but operates in, in the whole Western Balkans uh, region. So, so could, could you share with us uh, your thoughts uh, on, on the current situation uh, when it comes to uh, the security of gas supply? Uh, in Slovenia, but also broader in the region? Uh, thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation to this uh, panel. I believe that uh, uh, the topic which we are discussing today of the panel is not a topic only for today's discussion. This will be 
most probably, I believe so, a constantly discussion in the through the energy sectors in, in the future as well. Um, yeah, when we are discussing securing uh, securing the gas supply into the into the region, uh, of course, it's very similar for the region or even in the wider context, Europe, for example. Uh, uh, the key message from my side is probably it was all, already spoken uh, spoken that is diversification of the supply, and uh, we also what uh, two years ago what happened, how the dependency on one supply source can jeopardize the jeopardize the security of the supply and how that has a had a big impact on the activities of our group mm -hmm. uh, or even uh, on the end market uh, and end consumer market so the prices went up a lot so everybody was uh, not not happy um, so underline I would say the, the key message uh, I mean security supply is the crucial to avoid uh, or even to be better in avoiding some geopolitical conflicts. Uh, with that, we can ensure better, I would say, economical stability, not only for us, I mean, in the wider, uh, wider uh, prospect. And of course, with that, with the diversification of the supply, we can, we can ensure better security and reliability of the supply. But how to achieve that? So we, we as well, uh, that can be supported with the infrastructure. Fortunately or unfortunately, the gas, natural gas, is, is something which needs uh, a lot of massive investment. But if you look, for example, the area, uh, area what we are talking now, for example, this, this region is, part of the region is much better, uh, I would say, uh, developed in terms of infrastructure. And there are some parts uh, which are much less uh, developed uh, in, in terms of in infrastructure. Uh, that's why this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, projects are crucial or, or at least very important to support, to support uh, the diversification of the supply. When we are talking, for example, south corridor, vertical corridor in, in Bulgaria, uh, uh, this is something which we'll have to uh, address and we should have to implement. But we can also discuss better utilization of existing, uh, I would say, infrastructure. We discussed Ukraine gas storages, which can uh, definitely give the flexibility to this system. Uh, usage of LNG storages in uh, Greece and, uh, and also Turkish, also to supply this part of, uh, this part of the region. Uh, now to the third point, uh, we are successful in these projects can be cross-border uh, cooperation between the states, between the entities. But I would say not only cross-border, because we are talking about cross-regional uh, cooperation, which, kill, which definitely will support uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, uh, project. And the last message for now, for, from my side, would be that I'm happy that we acknowledge that, this, uh, that natural gas basically is not a, not a part, of the, part of the problem of the, our long-run targets the, of the decarbonization, but is a part of the solution. Uh, and later we will discuss about the, uh, some other uh, topics regarding the short-term uh, prospects and... Uh, yes, of course. It's not a coincidence that, that all the speakers um, uh, actually uh, have chosen three points to, to, to <laughs> highlight, because yeah. we have a clear view of, hopefully still, we have a, of the highest mountain in Slovenia, which is called Triglo. It has three heads, so that everything is, <laughs> is, um, is three in, in, in Slovenia. Y you can see it probably from, from the platform during the coffee break, which is, which is about to come. Uh, before we open the floor for uh, questions and suggestions from, uh, from the... Um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. maybe just to add something, maybe it will not be three. Uh, it's fourth. fourth. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, regarding, the region, because well, um, regarding the region, because you said <laughs> we, as a group and uh, we, we still, uh, the region, uh, we see that uh, demand will, will, will be higher, will mm -hmm. grow, especially due to uh, the main driver for that will be, on our opinion, uh, coal to gas switch yeah. and uh, power to gas. So this is now, in this region, is a lot of thermo uh, power plants and this, uh, due to the targets, uh, climate targets will have to be changed and the gas is the here, in case the infrastructure will allow us, the gas mm -hmm. is here, the best solution. Th that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Poletti, well, you spoke about, let's say, positive, uh, positive um, issues uh, from the region, but w which areas do you consider in the region the most problematic for, for the 
market here in, in the region. Um, and, and, and also when it comes to, to, to the integration of, of uh, the market and supply. Well, um, of course, this is a region where you have a lot of investment needs. So it's important, I think, all uh, the, uh, this integrated planning mm -hmm. and uh, coordinated scenarios, uh, uh, that's, that's key to understand how to manage the develop of the infrastructures that you need today, mm -hmm. together with the um, transition uh, and the implementation of the uh, decarbonization package. Uh, so that's uh, a challenge that is not just of this region, yep. uh, it's all over Europe, but some area in Europe uh, have higher investment needs than others. Uh, another um, uh, challenge, uh, I think, uh, is uh, the way uh, we charge uh, for uh, for the infrastructures, uh, uh, the because we we need to make sure that tar the tariff system or additional charges uh, don't become a barrier to the inefficient. Uh, uh, efficient flows in the region and outside the region. Um, and we as regulators, uh, we are uh, looking into ways to make, uh, uh, in general, uh, the system of capacity allocation more flexible. Something that has already been mentioned is that our gas system, the European gas system, needs more flexibility because prices are going to, to be more volatile mm -hmm. and uh, even uh, uh, demand uh, is, un is uncertain. So we need to think whether our current regulatory framework on the gas side is um, optimized according to these needs. And that um, uh, refers to LNG as well, the capacity allocation for LNG terminals and this trade-off between short-term and long-term uh, allocation uh, and how to auction. Uh, and I think we have a very interesting tool in the gas system that is this um, uh, incremental capacity process, but maybe there there is an opportunity to improve the process and, and adapt it. So um, we, we have to work on the ground to improve the way things work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mrs. Ajowski, you mentioned um, uh, your newest report on, on the regional perspective. Uh, <coughs> where do you see, uh, let's say, key, I wouldn't say problems, but key challenges uh, for, for the, let's say, short-term uh, approach uh, in the region? In any case, uh, I, I don't believe it should be a competition. Uh, which country needs to somehow uh, mm -hmm. uh, need more support. Um, I would say that the bottlenecks are quite clear. Uh, there are um, a very good uh, network at UNDP and network planning and, uh, you know, documents which uh, are showcasing what is needed in future to make sure that the system works mm -hmm. properly and uh, um, diversification, security of supply, interconnectivity are well developed. In any case, what is important here is, um, and especially with the crisis, we saw that when there is a need of a finance, um, investments are very, investments are the key. Mm. So um, I can give an example with my country. Uh, two years ago, um, on 1st of October, it was a big date because finally the interconnector between Bulgaria and Greece uh, was um, announced as operational mm -hmm. and started working. I can tell you that this project was running and we were working on that for almost 10 years, so there was a lot of discussions, a lot of reasons that this was not happening. But in it, on the final moment, a lot of efforts were mm -hmm. put in this regard. So you can see that, um, uh, you know, one of the countries in the region is now very, I mean, better connected of, of what it was. So for, for the region, investments need to be considered properly to make sure that the bottlenecks mm -hmm. are um, soft. And especially when we talk about the connectivity with LNG mm -hmm. uh, terminals and also with the storages, because those are the two elements of the infrastructure which are also key. And you mentioned LNG, and I go to Mr. Fugash again. Well, you, you, you spoke about the, your, your expansion uh, progress. Do you have problems with finding investors? Do you have uh, problems in finding partners also, also within the region or, or not? Well, actually, no. For this capacity increase, we are 
almost divided. So 50% we are getting from Croatia state and the other 50% will be co-funded by the, by the company, by the LNG Croatia. So mm -hmm. we do not have any partner with us. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were a force idea because uh, Slovenia and Croatia are cooperating quite, quite um, in a long-term way when it comes to nuclear energy, that, that Slovenia would somehow uh, uh, be also involved in, in the LNG uh, terminal expansion. Is, is this off, off the table? Well, or? well, no, it's not. I mean, the capacity increase is not only the let's say, reconstruction of the LNG terminal. It is also the construction of the pipeline from the... It's not from the terminal, it's 20 kilometers from the terminal mm -hmm. until uh, Bosiljevo, and also that is a phase one. And also the Croatia government uh, received the, the information for the phase two of the construction of the pipeline that will be... Uh, one, one part will be up to the Slovenia, so we can say that you are also here uh, in, the, in the partnership with us. Great. M Mr. Podkriznik, any thoughts from your side when it comes to, let's say, specific problems or challenges in the region? Uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, that what we already tackled, uh, uh, probably not. Uh, I mean, the LNG, uh, LNG terminal now, it's uh, very good for the, for the region. The other, the other uh, difficulties uh, regarding the infrastructure are still uh, still on. So this this region definitely have to improve mm -hmm. in terms of uh, infrastructure development if we would like to supply uh, this region uh, mm -hmm. with uh, with uh, with uh, natural gas. So not the other one. I mean, uh, beside the infrastructure, which is the key challenge, and uh, the, um, I would say. Uh, cross-regional uh, cooperation, like for a uh, southern corridor and verti vertical corridor, mm -hmm. this would be definitely a big benefit for the, for the region. Great. We're now open to, to uh, questions or perhaps suggestions from, from the audience, so the floor is yours. Uh, asking questions is not a national sport in Slovenia. We have a lot of them, like cycling, skiing, so but it's, probably, it's probably different here and now, we, we'll see. So, and any questions for, for the expert panel? Well, th this is the Slovenian way. Uh, no problem. I mean... Uh, uh, there is one question. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. One helping hand. Yeah. Just, just, just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask this question to the whole panel, but I'd be interested in Clara Poletti's thoughts on this. Um, and I'd like to ask um, if you could comment a bit on storage neutrality charges and um, how the impact flows to Central and Eastern Europe from Germany. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, the neutrality charge... Germany pops up every, every, yeah. um, every time, uh, also, also in this case, yes. The neutrality charge, of course, uh, is having an impact. Uh, especially on uh, some uh, some member states are some gas systems are more affected than others like uh, Austria Czech Republic uh, and uh, uh, it's it's one of the unilateral measures that uh, sort of conflict with the cooperative approach and that the exante approach that I was mentioning uh, if we see an issue uh, about uh, a lack of a framework on how um, costs that are related to security of supply and uh, solidarity, uh, if we see a, a lack of a uh, common framework there, we should uh, uh, sit and discuss on how those costs could be uh, recovered efficiently. But uh, a cross-border uh, um, levy has a, a distortionary impact on the market and a, a unilateral levy. Uh, but even if it were not unilateral, I think it would have a distortionary impact. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's my view. Um, it's not the, the best way forward. A any other thoughts on, on neutrality charges, uh, Germany? No? We keep that. Any other uh, question from the audience? Not yet. Perhaps you will change your, your uh, uh, mind. Well, uh, 
perhaps we'll, we can also start to, to prepare for, for the final round for, for your visions when it comes to, let's say, a long-term future. Although, you know, this famous, famous quote by, by, by a German politician that, that those who have visions should see a doctor, but that applies only, only for politicians, and you're, you're clearly not, uh, not uh, politicians. W one question, perhaps specifically for you, uh, Mr. Podkriznik, storage. I mean, we, we, we know that in, in Slovenia we, we actually don't have, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an, any storage. So, so how do you see this, let's say, challenge or, or problem? Can, can we solve it, uh, let's say, regionally? First, uh, I would like to mention that we have uh, also our own ideas uh, regarding the storage, and this was also uh, presented to the uh, to the to the ministry, but uh, not we will not discuss now about the location. So, uh, yeah, that would be much appreciated if we would be able to, of course, uh, mm -hmm. have our own storage, because the storage uh, gives uh, to this infrastructure a lot of flexibility. And the seasonal, this is like a seasonal battery because mm -hmm. you can store the, the, the storage. Uh, and so we have our ambitions, uh, ambitions also for that. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, for the trading purposes, we have to use uh, the, the infrastructure which, which is used everywhere in the region. Eh? Mm -hmm. W which is a normal way. That yeah, there was some, way, some, yeah. some fractions between yeah. Austria and Germany also also in the time of crisis, but but now actually um, the thing is somehow uh, settled now. Well, well, if we don't have any... Qu yeah, we have another question, another lady. Yes, good morning. The lady showed away. <laughs> My name is Eva Hennig. I'm the chair of the distribution committee in Eurogas. And I would also have a question to Ms. Podgrichnik. Um, on the gas distribution here in Slovenia, because it's widely spread, I know that you have several gas distribution companies here in Slovenia, and what we can see across Europe is that the, the DSOs are clear on the path on decarbonization with biomethan and hydrogen and getting ready for this. And my question would be, how is this developing um, also in Slovenia? Because in most countries, the biomethan plants are connected to the distribution and also most of the electrolyzers will be connected to the distribution level. Can you see something similar here in Slovenia? And is it supported also by the government in some way? Uh, yeah, thanks for the, for the question. Of course, in, uh, in our group and uh, with, uh, also with our subsidiary, Geoplin, we are following these uh, uh, targets as well regarding the decarbonization and using the infrastructure also for sustainable gases as biomethane as, uh, and also the, also the uh, hydrogen, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, we, have, uh, we can feel the support also from the, the government side, also from the, from the uh, EU side. And uh, while we are now also tackle our uh, uh, new strategy, which will be from 2025 to 2030, and uh, we will definitely address and uh, follow the, the targets uh, which, are, which we have to finally uh, follow uh, according to the targets, uh, climate targets which we have uh, that we would like to live then for in low carbon or zero carbon society in the long run future. But it is also interesting because we will tackle this, this question also in, in, in the next panel. So uh, if there are no questions anymore no gentlemen which is interesting but no problem now we can go to the let's say vision and and final part of our uh, discussion uh, mr fugger so w what is your particular vision when it comes to your terminal and of course what, what we also heard uh, by by ms jigri uh, so, so what changes do you see in, in the security of 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 um, the gas supply in the region in the let's say near and and far far future Okay, so as we mentioned, the major project, probably the only important project that we are now doing is the capacity increase that we will try to answer this. Any, any future energy demand that not only Croatia, but also the country in the region will have. And we uh, expect that in the start of gas year 25, 26, we'll be over with all the works that we need to do, and the new uh, capacity will be offered sometime by the end of this year. 
and with uh, that in mind and in mind that the Plinacro will also finish the construction of the rest of the pipelines, I think that the terminal will answer this to any, any, any normal or any future energy crisis if there will be one. Great, great to hear, Mr. Podkrižnik, your visions. Uh, my, uh, I mean, our vision definitely is uh, to uh, develop the uh, the region in terms of the, and also that again we acknowledge that natural gas and further on the sustainable gas is, is the key for the transition. And in these terms, we see what we already discussed: all this development infrastructure, uh, very very important. So I would say short term definitely to utilize uh, what we already have. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we, I believe that we can better utilize that uh, for trading uh, and also for the supply uh, purposes. And midterm, uh, uh, like this new project, what we discussed, and long run, uh, the, the targets we should have to, because the good things on the, on the infrastructure which we have with the, with, the, with the natural gas is also then in the future, this infrastructure can be used for, for the other, uh, I would say, su sustainable gases, biomethane, hydrogen, what we... So, uh, uh, and other, uh, I would say, uh, renewable gases. Great. N not only that we, uh, in Slovenia, we apply the rule, ladies first, ladies ask questions, ladies have also uh, the last word. Uh, so, so, Mrs. Uh, Artrovsky, uh, how do you see the future? You spoke already about it. H how greener uh, will, will the gas uh, we will use in the future uh, be in, in Europe and also in the region? Well, that's the willingness, right? Um, and um, I, well, we mentioned the very important role in the natural gas uh, in the transitional uh, period. Indeed, there's a target that we have to reach uh, in the procedure of decarbonization, which we are as an infrastructure very much willing to, mm -hmm. to, to do and to deliver. I think First, of course, is very much important to make sure that the interconnectivity is it's secured and the system mm -hmm. works very well uh, to make sure that every crisis uh, from now on, hopefully not, not to happen, but uh, everything is it's secured in this regard. And I'm very happy to hear that the region is, uh, is doing that much, I mean, uh, with, with the LNG terminal and also I understand there is a perspective for storage. Um, this is this is really really good, and then in the long term, indeed, um, biomethane, <coughs> which I understood that uh, well, it's not completely excluded from the discussion from your side, although that it's not a big potential. But hydrogen, indeed, which also brings a lot of uh, a lot of questions because. In these regards, the, the European Commission willingness is also quite um, ambitious in regards to, let's say, the market, how it has mm -hmm. to function, the, the produ uh, production the, um, and of hydrogen. And indeed, here, what is very much important is to make sure that we are doing this with the proper speed mm -hmm. in a very cost-efficient uh, manner and also maintaining on the same time security of supply. Of course, hydrogen brings um, another issues on the table. Indeed, we need to make sure when we talk about the gas infrastructure, so first we start with the repurposing, mm -hmm. then of course uh, another network in parallel, it seems it needs to, to take place. So have an increase with the, the hydrogen corridors, which are planned indeed. Uh, so this is kind of a long-term perspective. The right. future is bright and we're oh. happy to deliver. Hopefully. Well, the weather is fine today, yes. but it will be cloudier in the afternoon, I must warn you. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Poletti, your, uh, let's say, final words uh, before we head to uh, not gas molecules, but, but coffee. <laughs> Myself before the coffee, and I'm Italian, so I'm not going to talk about the weather. Okay. Um, the <clears throat> looking uh, far ahead, uh, I think the the real uh, challenge, uh, things are going to change, we all know it, uh, but uh, uh, the pragmatic approach that was mentioned uh, before will be necessary because um, each, um, not just member state, but each uh, neighborhood somehow will need to find its own solution, uh, keeping this uh, uh, coordinate 
coordinated and consistent approach along all the chain. Uh, that was said uh, um, earlier on. That's, so that requires managing the transition, looking at, uh, at the same time to the demand side, because that if the demand is not there, what are we going to do? I mean, just paying money, that, that's, very, that's key, because sometimes we forget about the, the demand. And so uh, starting from the demand upward, uh, we need to assess the needs and the, the, the best energy portfolio of the area. And, and there is, uh, I think, something that sometimes we forget. We have in mind, we say it when we go to conferences, everybody says. But uh, when it's time to implement, that becomes very difficult because you have to start discussing uh, whether you, you, your uh, heating and cooling needs, for example, at the local level. How can I make sure that people move from natural gas to hydrogen or to heat pumps, or uh, do I want to, uh, to have a transition where each of us is able to choose its own uh, energy uh, source, or uh, that that's could be too expensive, having somebody choosing uh, district heating and somebody else moving uh, to uh, heat pumps in the same neighborhood. Don't mention heat pumps to the Germans, by the way. Uh, okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Anyway, so I think this uh, this is a complex uh, um, uh, setup, and uh, we really uh, need to uh, look to. Uh, have a fact-based and knowledge-based approach. When it comes to Acer, do you see a new role also for this for this uh, agency? Because there was a lot of discussions what what Acer would do in in the in the um, uh, in the future, especially regarding the whole the whole energy package. Well, we are going to implement uh, the decarbonization package and all the other provisions that already Acer has new. Uh, competencies that we have to implement. I think of a remit, for example, mm -hmm. uh, just to mention one. So yes, the uh, the way uh, the role of Acer is is moving uh, and and changing over time. Of course, the 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 approach is always and still is the, the cooperative approach. So we we manage that. I think we have to be very uh, proud of what we have done in the energy sectors in Europe because we managed to write, thanks to, to all the operators as well, to have network codes that have been written at European level and they are directly applicable at national level. This is something that is a first of a kind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took time but was very difficult to, to do. So, Europe is complicated, but it's still beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, th <laughs> thank you very much uh, um, to the panelists. In the meantime, we would like to save the world and uh, do a successful transition towards um, decarbonization. And I'll, I'll uh, just, bef just like before, uh, start with an opening round on your, your um, uh, particular position from your position uh, regarding the um, current situation and, of course, uh, the surrounding, the legislative landscape surrounding liquid gases, LPG, bio-LPG, bio RDME. Uh, so, so, Mrs. Abramiuklete, uh, how do you see uh, this and, and, of course, uh, how do you see the, uh, um, our um, union uh, meeting the carbon neutrality targets at EU level? Thank you. It's 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 a, probably a question everyone is asking themselves. Oh yes. Um, ev every but we would like to industry. hear your answer. <laughs> we in the LPG sector, so it's liquid gases. Uh, we represent the uh, the LPG sector, which uh, covers actually off-grid areas. So where a gas grid stops, then actually our work starts. Um, but we not only represent the LPG, so liquid petroleum gas, but also uh, more and more developing the renewable pathways. Mm -hmm for bio-LPG or renewable LPG, mm -hmm. and renewable and recycled carbon DME. So for our industry, I think um, I, our position is that all different types of energy plays a role mm -hmm. today, and they will play a role in 2030, 2040, and 2050. And we need all types of energy, not only for security of supply, but also to reach the carbon uh, neutrality uh, target. Mm -hmm. Uh, the production of, uh, in our sector of, of bio products, so bio LPG and uh, renewable secondary DME, is relatively small today, 
but it has grown exponentially in the past years. Mm -hmm. It is, it doesn't, what does it mean is there is a high interest in renewable products from consumers, but also we see, obviously the government and EU is pushing uh, mm -hmm. to, have, uh, to have more and more uh, those renewables available. That's say all kind of fuels should be taken in consideration. Mm -hmm. Those fuels that can lower CO2 emissions and those fuels that also contribute to renewable target. So in, in where we look at is the rural population. In Europe, it's 137 million people that live in rural areas. Mm -hmm. In Slovenia itself, it's almost 36%. It's, it's, even, it's even more it's somehow because our cities are so small. So they're <laughs> basically uh, villages, sorry. Uh, uh, so it's actually 50-50. It's interesting. And it, yes, and for, for those communities, it's not always very easy to electrify or mm -hmm. have uh, you know, uh, other options. So that's where the, the, the LPG kicks in. And with time, what is interesting in the bioproducts is that you have actually the same infrastructure, very well established infrastructure that you can use, and you just replace the LPG mm -hmm. with bioproducts, with bio LPG and the renewable and cycle DME, a mix of, of that. So, I think utilization of this infrastructure today is very important. Uh, you don't need to develop it more. You just replace the fuel uh, mm. towards the renewables. A huge investment going on. Uh, actually, Slovenia is also uh, receiving some bio LPG, so they consume bio LPG already today. And as we see, there is a huge potential for Slovenian market to develop further, not only Slovenia, but in the region as yeah. well to develop further. Uh, as, as, as there is a big push for, for renewables in the region. Mm. So I am quite optimistic going forward. I think there is a lot of investment happening, not only in our sector, in the bio-LPG, but we see in biomethane sector mm. and, other, and other renewables. So I am quite optimistic that we, we can reach the carbon neutrality target. This is great to hear. We are now um, here, let's say, the Slovenian perspective of it. Uh, we go on with, with you, uh, Mrs. Laudic. You come from a very interesting uh, company, which is called Koto. It, it, you used to be Cortex Torbus, and I, I remember when I was a small kid, there was a cartoon a mm -hmm. commercial um, on TV when a piglet came, um, and then uh, he actually pulled down his skin and said, uh, "This skin is for Koto." <laughs> uh, so it's uh, you can watch, you can you can see that at YouTube. It's quite interesting. Koja is a Koto. Now, of course. The company has, has made a transition from, from that on. What are you doing? What, what could be of, of, of interest for, for, for the audience regarding, let's say, biogases? Uh, yes, uh, dear guests and organizers, uh, thank you for inviting us so that we can present our project of biomethane production. Uh, actually, today, uh, Biogas Koto is producing biogas from uh, food waste or remains from the food industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very sustainable feedstock and we have a half megawatt power uh, biogas plant located in Ljubljana. Uh, the location is quite favorable. If we want to connect the biomethane uh, plant to the gas grid, we could connect also to the distribution as well as to transport uh, gas grid that is uh, nearby. Uh, and uh, today we can say we produce electricity and co-produce heat and we use totally uh, like eight uh, gigawatt hours per year of this energy for our own uh, needs mainly. Uh, with production of biomethane, we could uh, produce 20 gigawatt hours per year, uh, meaning we could use more uh, energy of the produced biogas and send this gas to the gas grid. Uh, we could not only assure uh, biomethane for industry, but also for... Um, households or, or mm -hmm. other, because it, it could be used in the same way as natural so, gas. So, so the new <laughs> motto would be not uh, skin is for koto, but food waste is for koto and for green energy. Yeah, the, bi the biogas production is mainly with the, uh, the food, food waste that is produced in the food industry or in the sales uh, chain. So this right. is uh, this is the main. Uh, we, we, we'll tackle the potentials here uh, a little bit later on. I would like to hear uh, also the views of, of Mr. Uh, Ilersic, who who uh, is uh, of course a senior consultant at Plinovodi um, and in charge of strategic development um, in the company. 
Um, he's in the company since 2001. Yep. It's it's a pretty long, <laughs> a pretty long way. Uh, please share with us your your, your thought on, on on the development of a, of the gas. Uh, infrastructure when it comes to let's say future future potentials of, of biogases thank you for the question and good morning to all of you and and thank you organizers uh, for having me here so uh, of course the the gas grid will will do our work in order to uh, to to make uh, this transition happen that we can use the, the renewable gases into gas grids. Maybe first, an interesting thing to say, well, the, the gas grid is, is already uh, uh, carbon neutral but mm. a, as a grid, as an infrastructure, so it depends what it comes into the grid. Uh, and here we, we see two ways forward. Uh, first will be that uh, more and more renewable gases will come into existing grid. So additional biomethane, synthetic methane, and also, according to the new directive, uh, less than 2% of hydrogen. So biomethane, I think it's, it's really a perfect case of circular economy when you use waste mm -hmm. to, produ to produce gas and to, to use it as a gas. It's big advantage that you can use it with the same appliances as now. Also, industry can use the same machines, the same uh, furnaces to, to burn this gas. So no investments are needed on the side of industry. So this is about biomethane, and it is not storytelling. In Denmark, there is 38% of gas in the gas grid is biomethane, already now. And it was achieved in, in a short period, in something like 10 years. Then, regarding the hydrogen, maybe you, you would say, okay, 2% is really little, uh, nothing really special, but it can help the pilot projects for hydrogen, that uh, a producer of hydrogen can inject into the grid this 2%, but for them is this uh, the solution how to cope with, with the production of hydrogen. So it uh, enables uh, small projects for hydrogen. So this is one, one direction with, with the existing grid. In parallel to this grid, it will develop the hydrogen network, which will be dedicated to pure hydrogen. Probably the most uh, complex vision of this is European hydrogen backbone, which is an initiative of transmission system operators. More than 30 of us uh, are working on this vision. And there is idea to have an uh, integrated network all around Europe to transport hydrogen. And according to, to our analysis, more than half of this network can be done in a way that old pipes are used. So this means it is much cheaper because you use the pipes which are already there. The development can be faster because, uh, because you don't need to build the, the new pipe. And, and also, it is an envi environmental friendly because you don't uh, have these con construction works. So this can be achieved in a reasonable manner. So these are two directions. And these systems then will, will work for quite some time in parallel. So we will have the, 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 the classical system with uh, renew renewable gases and, and in parallel also hydrogen system for dedicated for hydrogen. Great, so we're getting pragmatic. Only two directions, not three. <laughs> um, it's, it's okay, M M Mr. Skinder, well, uh, what are your thoughts uh, regarding uh, the benefits, challenges, and, and, and um, um, the challenges of, of renewables uh, from, let's say, Brussels Slovenian perspective? Because you're based in Brussels, but of course, re representing Slovenian interests there. Yeah. Is EU doing enough for Slovenia and vice versa? Are, are we actually uh, doing enough for, for, for EU? Uh, that's a very tough question, but I will, I will yeah. re I'll revert to that in a second. Um, good afternoon to everyone, I'm, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank Still you. not afternoon. We Thanks. Have, yeah. Not yet? <laughs> yeah. Correct. Okay. 
Well, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and it's been a while since I've been to this beautiful estate here. Um, and allow me to start a little bit with the weather discussion, which was very much top of mind in the because morning session. Because you're based in Brussels, of course. You're yes, I would just like to defend Brussels. Uh, it was a <laughs> beautiful sunny day when, when I left Brussels. Um, it's a sunny and warm day today, as, as far as I've heard. And those of us who have spent our youth in Ljubljana, we can know that it can get pretty damp and foggy. So um, I just wanted to say things can be equally bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here and there. Thank um, you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, um, the average temperature in Belgium in, in February was twice the average. Um, precipitation was, uh, it was the second wettest month in history um, since records began. And I'm saying this because obviously climate change um, is, is real. Um, that being said, we, um, this is a very timely discussion. Decarbonization of the gas system is a very timely discussion. And I think we also need a very honest discussion on this topic, meaning uh, the the benefits have been mentioned. I will not dwell um, on the benefits so much, environmental benefits, um, energy security benefits, also social benefits. The gas package itself recognizes the role of biogases and biomethane in, in, um, in carbon intensive regions particularly. Um, but maybe allow me to, do, to say a couple of words and be the devil's advocate also on the challenges um, related to, to biogases, biomethane and, and low carbon gases, which, was, which was, should also not leave out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them is um, our investment decisions. We've heard a lot about grids, interconnectors, um, storages. Um, the investment decisions going forward will have to be aligned, first of all, with our uh, climate trajectories, but also with what's happening in the industry. Supply and demand laws um, of the off-takers obviously will also govern um, future investment decisions. Um, the gas package itself, which was mentioned a couple of times, talks also not only about repurposing, but also decommissioning. So I think those kind of decisions will have to be well balanced. Climate risks, um, physical climate risks will pose a threat to our infrastructure. Uh, existing gas infrastructure, we've already seen that. So planning forward, we will have to take this very, very, very concrete physical risk into account. Um, there's a lot of debate about cannibalization um, in the market. Um, cannibalization of, of feedstock, cannibalization um, in the food sector is actually a word in German um, called a Vermeisung, which means using growing maize for non-food um, purposes and how we manage the use of, of, of land and how we manage the use of renewable sources in the production of green hydrogen so that we don't get, give the wrong incentives to the market. So just to recap, it's, it is not a civil or solution. It is a solution, but it should be used carefully. Um, it should be used smartly and very tailored. Um, and that brings me to the, to the final part of my introductory remarks, which is the situation in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. um, we are a very small market. Uh, well, we are a very small country, as you might have noticed. Um, Mr. Bergant, we lived on the same street not so long ago. Well, with Mr. Bittens, we shared an office a couple of years ago. It's a very tightly knit small... So this is actually, it's actually a miracle that we're not related. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah, Who yeah, knows? That's, that's true. Um, but that being said, a small market um, is not necessarily a bad thing. I think we can be very smart in the way we develop our grids and the way we deploy um, renewable and low carbon gases in Slovenia. We have a small distribution network. I think it's about 5,000 kilometers compared to 2 million kilometers Europe-wide. Um, so we will probably have to talk about localized um, application in very specific sectors um, and applications. The National Energy and Climate Plan is somewhat clear on this respect. Um, it is talking about um, power sector. Um, Mr. Bittens mentioned that um, in his introductory remarks. Um, we are mentioning the transport, which is a bit of a difficult not to break um, for some time in terms of decarbonization. So um, with some more analysis, flow analysis of energy sources and, and, and wise application, I think we can really use what the um, EU legislative framework has given us going forward. Great. Uh, let, let us stick to, to Slovenia. Mrs. Lauric, well, we hear that all the time. Slovenia is small. We are a small market, uh, of course. Uh, but, but I mean, how, how do you see the present situation uh, when it comes to use of technologies uh, in, in upgrading uh, of biogas to, to, to biomethane? Are we really so small or do we actually lack ambition in this field? Yes, the targets for biomethane production in Slovenia are not set yet, and the uh, the supporting mechanisms are developing. Is uh, it a, so is, is it a good thing that they're not set, or or I mean? No, for the investors, uh, the potential investor in biomethane production today could not get investment support mm. or uh, operational support for produced mm. biomethane. 
Uh, but the support scheme uh, should be uh, should be changed and include mm -hmm. uh, the gaseous biofuels, uh, so uh, that uh, this this uh, would enable a stable environment uh, for the investors and mm -hmm. uh, the accelerate the production of biomethane. Uh, so we, as a potential investor, are waiting for the uh, for the support mechanism because the project is technically feasible, but we are uh, mm -hmm. still uh, need economic feasibility to do the project. So uh, at the moment, uh, four uh, biogas plants are interested um, to upgrade uh, the existing plants to to biomethane plants. Uh, from 26 uh, biogas plant in operation. Uh, recently, one plant started to produce bio-CNG. Uh, at the moment, no plant is connected to the gas grid uh, because we still need some uh, regulation there, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how, to do, how, to, how to do this. Uh, and the huge development in other countries uh, is because of the national mechanisms that support uh, this production. Uh, so we have uh, in south uh, in northern European countries uh, we have uh, um, good examples where uh, poli policy is uh, very supportive. So uh, in Slovenia we are looking forward to to the mechanisms that will support the transit. So we would need some Scandinavian impact. Well, what we have uh, as Scandinavians have is a lot of forests. Slovenia is actually one of the most forest-rich countries in, in Europe on, on the Scandinavian level, but, of course, not in every every sense uh, when it comes to that. I mean, Mr. Ilicic, how do you see, let's say, the, the, the potential uh, which is used in Slovenia? Of course, you provide the backbone, but, but, but actually, what do you think about the muscles in Slovenia when, when it comes to, to new technologies and, and uh, biomethane and... and, and uh, yeah, using maybe, maybe we are not... Uh, optimistic enough. I mean, uh, I agree that there are limits uh, regarding the, the potential of biomethane, but let's say an average approximation is that uh, about 20% of, of uh, consumption can be, can be done by biomethane. I am speaking uh, European-wide. Mm -hmm. Uh, but probably something similar can be done here. Uh, we have this uh, Pannonia, uh, Pannonia Plateau, uh, not Plateau, but the plain, plain yeah. uh, um, uh, which Slovenia has one part on, on the eastern part of the country, and there is Hungary and Croatia and so on, and there is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of farms w which could produce biomethane. I, I was discussing with my colleague in, in Denmark how, how they, they succeeded. Scandinavia again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Scandinavia again. But it's, uh, I like, let's say, this example because the, the Danish, uh, the Danish uh, land is also not so big. So it's uh, in a way comparable. Uh, so they had subvention to produce biomethane. And they decided on the national level that this, uh, first you get biogas bio and then you have to upgrade to biomethane. They decided they will not burn biogas to produce electricity and they will not give a, a subsidy for electricity, but they will give subsidy uh, to inject biomethane into the grid. And advantage of this is that when you have biomethane in, in the grid, you, everybody can use that, uh, that uh, biomethane. So from economic point of view, you can find then the customers which are willing to pay a little bit more uh, in order to have renewable gas. So uh, the whole country then benefits from better allocating this uh, biomethane. So what we basically lack, it's, what you say, is, is more or less ambition and, of course, investments. Yeah, uh, let's say policy shall be uh, directed in this way. Uh, mm -hmm. We understand very, very much that uh, for, I don't know, solar technology uh, uh, subsidies are needed. On the other hand, when we are speaking on gas, sometimes I get feeling that it should be done uh, like miracle somehow. Hmm. Uh, well... Alchemy is not, not uh, popular anymore. Uh, but uh, so, uh, Mrs. Abramiuk, uh, from your perspective, 
countries like, like Slovenia, and we, we've heard some some good good practices from from other parts of Europe. How is your view on on how such countries or, or the region as, as a whole should actually approach this these challenges and potential, which apparently lies there, but it's it's not so well recognized. Um. It's 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 a com it's a com complex answer, of course. Oh yeah, but, because um, Europe is complicated. <laughs> Europe is and complicated. Slovenia is complicated too, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> but we have 27 different member states with with uh, with the ability to choose their energy mix, mm -hmm. right? Because we live in different parts. I, I'm, I'm Polish. I live in Belgium, Poland, Belgium, Slo Slo Slovenia has very very different uh, uh, situations. But um, just just to Come back a little bit on biomethane. Um, uh, bio LPG and um, renewable second DME, they're very, very interesting products itself, uh, but they can be produced f via many different production pathways. Uh, m most uh, popular today is HV, also biodiesel co product, as well as sustainable uh, aviation fuel, which we know in the future is going to, to see a lot of investments in Europe. Part of it will be bio biogas to bio LPG as well, which is, I think, something we see as uh, an interesting production pathway after 2030. And with the European Biogas Association, they see actually much more of biomethane uh, possibility mm -hmm. uh, Europe-wise than uh, than uh, the 35 BCM that is that was inscribed in the uh, Repower EU. Now, there is a small issue there, because when you analyze the national energy uh, plans yep. of member states, the total number is around 20 BCM. So I think it's kind of like underestimation, but it's also perhaps I would call it lack of ambition uh, or lack of uh, uh, tr trust that this actually will, will, is going to develop. While actually the industry is saying we are ready we are ready to come with investments, and the same for, for our industry. We are ready, we are putting a lot of money, we put billions of euros into investing into new bio LPG plants, mm -hmm. new RDME plants. But we need to make sure that we have um, uh, the, the demand. So we need to make sure that the policy is very clear moving forward. We need to make sure that in, in transport, for instance, transport is a very big part also on the mm. consumption, by the way, in Slovenia as well. Um, in transport, that, 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 uh, that there will be consumption in the future. In, in heating, that there will be consumption in the future. Uh, for industrial purposes, I think it's easier because that's, that's something that is growing and it will really need a lot of uh, uh, input from gasless, uh, gasless fuels. Uh, but, but this is one thing. Second thing is financing. You know, it's, it's, it's still, you know, it goes here or there, it's very particularly chosen. Uh, well, there is so much uh, kind of very easy ways to reach that, those targets with gasless fuels, I think, uh, because of the abundance of, of, for instance, biogas of, of, uh, or, um, or ga gas, renewable gasless fuels in, in general. So I, I would say that um, generally, I, I think, should be more ambition from all all countries, all member states, mm -hmm. and, and more trust given into the sector. Uh, we, are, we are already in this business for a very long time. We really have established infrastructure. We have very direct contact with customers, especially in the LPG business, which is really mm -hmm. going to, to, to the customer in rural area. Uh, so, so we know there are also their needs, and, um, and we, know, we know that they want an easy transition, right? So let's make sure that we make this transition as easy as possible for them. If they have an installed boiler, that you change the fuel into renewable instead of uh, changing the boiler itself into technologies that maybe they cannot afford, because not everyone can afford uh, you know, having renovation of the house or, or changing into something very expensive, very expensive heating system. So, so it's, it's a complex answer, but I would just call for a little bit more ambition there. Great. It's great to hear. Hopefully, it will, it will encourage uh, uh, people involved. Uh, Mrs. Laudic, before we open the floor for uh, possible questions from, from the audience, you mentioned that, of course, uh, uh, there is a lack on, on um, let's say, framework 
uh, to to invest in in uh, biogases when it comes to to the national energy and climate plan in Slovenia well, uh, how do you see the position of renewable uh, gases in there it's still being discussed but but we we more or less hope that it will be it will be uh, presented in due time mm -hmm. yes national uh, energy and clim uh, climate plan is now under revision and uh, it includes uh, biomethane together with hydrogen as important re renewable gases, green, green hydrogen. And um, it, it is uh, definitely what needs to be uh, further included is how to, how to get this uh, biomethane. Uh, we need to understand that in Europe now, uh, tw around 20,000 biogas plants um, According to the Repower EU plan, uh, part of, of those plants could, could mm -hmm. convert to biomethane plant with like 17 BCMs uh, scenario of, of uh, possible production. Uh, and then there's also a goal to build new biogas plants uh, with the sustainable feedstocks like uh, manure or, or food scraps. Uh, and uh, this could be like thousands of, of big plants and uh, four, four thousand of small plants. So the, the biomethane uh, methane can, can be produced there. Uh, but how do we then uh, treat the gas to, to inject it to the gas grid? Um, we have to remove the water, we have to desulfurize it, take out the impurities. Uh, and uh, produce uh, the gas with more than 97% of the methane according to the standards. That means that this gas has a, a similar energy value mm -hmm. as uh, energetic value as, uh, as uh, natural gas. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the Europe set the goals, uh, the national goals uh, still needs to be more, more precise. And of course, according to the potential, what are the feedstocks that are locally available, that mm -hmm. are sustainable? We should build on those uh, uh, feedstock for, for new capacities, but the first step is to, to, to connect the, the existing biogas uh, plants uh, with the invest investments, of course, uh, for, for the upgrading and connect them to the grids. Um, uh, in, in short as possible time. Yeah, so we, we will uh, really uh, hoping for a revision soon of, of the plan and of course how this plan will actually um, look. So uh, we're now open for, for your questions if there are any uh, from the audience. Uh huh. Okay, national sport again. Yeah, yeah. There is one lady. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question for Eva for LPG, so I'm from LPG industry. How is the security of supply of LPG in the region? Thank you, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big question probably for, uh, for today, uh, especially as, as we've seen that LPG has been included in the section list um, and will be sanctioned uh, uh, as of uh, next year for some countries. Uh, in the region, non -LPG, none of the LPG comes from, uh, comes from Russia, so that's easier for Slovenia. Uh, there is a lot of production in neighboring countries, um, so it comes from uh, Croatia and Italy, and it's uh, transported, so it's, it's actually produced in the proximity and transported uh, mm -hmm. to Slovenia uh, to lower down the environmental footprint of the, of the transport as well and transported by, by trains or trucks. So it's, uh, I think a big amount is transported by trains. So I believe that mm. uh, at this point, uh, the region is pretty secured uh, in terms of the availability of LPG. Great, thank you. There was another lady who posed the question. Do we have any uh, gentlemen courageous enough to... <laughs> yeah, there is one. Uh, Hey, uh, I'm Nick Crow from Grissan Renewable Energy. We're the largest producer of biomethane in the UK. Uh, so you're not Slovenian? <laughs> unfortunately not. I've been seeing Slovenia okay. over the last 48 hours. I'm very curious. <coughs> if you think the weather's bad in Brussels, I can assure you it's worse in London, uh, which is a natural habit, as you rightly said. Okay. Um, a question for, I guess, uh, Gregor and, and Marco primarily, but also the wider panel around biomethane support in Slovenia. We've had some pretty good success in the UK. We've got about six terawatts of production through feed-in tariff support. 
What do you think would get the market moving in Slovenia and how far off do you honestly think that would be? Are companies like my own are ready to invest in plants that produce biomethane across Europe, um, but there's got to be the right regulatory regime in place to do so. So what do you reckon the horizon timeline is on that and what, what might it look like? Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. You want to go first? Please. Uh, yeah, I, I can go first. I'll, I'll try to be to be brief. Um, maybe from a policy perspective, obviously, because that's that's more more my, more my field of expertise. Um, what we are not lacking at the moment is legislation. We have enough legislation in place, um, and uh, is, there's been a big push on um, actually setting up market conditions for for re uh, renewable and low carbon gases um, in Europe. And I think. Um, to go to your question, which is how to actually promote that and um, um, scaling and, let's say, um, uh, boosting demand um, as well as production. Uh, well, the first advice would be to start implementing this regulation. We have uh, quite a few tools available in the existing regulation. I will maybe refrain to the, to the gas um, decarbonization um, package, but there are also other tools, such as the use of auctions um, um, from governments to, to, to um, boost um, supply and demand side. We've recently concluded um, um, the first uh, hydrogen auction um, by the European Hydrogen Bank member states can opt into those instruments and, and, and help boost demand. There is a lot that can be done in the area of um, certification and um, guarantees of origin that will boost intra EU trade. Uh, what cannot be produced locally can be imported or exported in case we have access. Um, and, and, and last but not least, maybe there's also obviously um, an investment plan. We will need clear investment uh, targets. The 10-year network development plans will have to be clear on what we will decommission, what we will um, repurpose. Um, and I think those signals to the market um, will also enable um, economic actors to, to form coalitions, to, to cluster around some, some bigger centers where feedstock is available and so forth. So I think it's a combination of, of implementation measures uh, that, will, that will help the market pick up. Okay, Mr. Jelšić. Yeah, I can just uh, tell what is going on in terms of connection uh, to the grid. Uh, so we are, we are interested and uh, everybody is invited to, to, to come to discuss the possibility to connect to either to our network or to the distribution network. We are also in discussion with Koto uh, what would be the best solution, but of course there should be also the business case uh, on their side, as mentioned before. Uh, so, uh, from the regulatory perspective, I can say that that is uh, we have the new standard about quality of gas is now in the, the final stage of adoption, which will ease a little bit the standard uh, for gas, which uh, can be transported mm -hmm. over the networks. So this will help also to accommodate uh, renewable gases. And there is also one more advantage in a new uh, gas directive, and this is that the, there is a proposal or idea that uh, on the borders, national borders, uh, the tariffs uh, to, to transport uh, renewable gas would, would have big discount uh, up to 100%. So this is the idea that, that uh, these renewable gases could, could flow over Europe without big problem. And I have to say that with some colleagues, we already discussed how, uh, how to modify our information system that mm -hmm. this could, could happen. Any other comments? No? So, yeah. Maybe I would just like to agree that, yeah, tariff, I forgot to mention tariffs, um, and we've discussed extensively um, the discount on interconnectors within the, within the council yeah. formations. Um, we found some sort of a compromise, which was not maybe the optimal solution, which the Commission originally proposed, which was um, default uh, discounts and then negotiation on potential tariffs, but I think, yes, the, the wise application and bilateral cooperation in that, in that sense will also help. Yeah, compromise is the middle name in Europe, <laughs> anyway. So, so uh, uh, any other questions? If not, then we would go to, to the final round. Well, of course, it's, it's the perspective of, of the transition uh, in Slovenia uh, regarding, uh, uh, let's say, bio-renewal uh, gases and decarbonization. Uh, how, how do you see it, Mr. Lidersic? Well, uh, maybe... I think we are, we are now in a very interesting phase of this transition. 
and especially a lot is going on on, on hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So I would like just to mention maybe two, two interesting things uh, according uh, regarding hydrogen. Uh, in in Holland, uh, last uh, last year started uh, uh, construction of the first part of their hydrogen backbone. It is 30 kilometers of pipe in in Rotterdam, and it it was started to to, to be constructed. So uh, this is let's say first, uh, at least in my view, first uh, concrete step in order to get uh, to to this uh, hydrogen backbone. Actually, they, they have an idea how to make loop around Holland and, and uh, government decided that uh, approximately half of the investment will be covered uh, from, from government. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, an important signal uh, of, of uh, Netherlands government. And the second interesting thing is that in Germany they agreed upon topology of the hydrogen grid in Germany, about 10,000 kilometers. It is now agreed how it will, will look like, and there is a plan. And the, the third one, also, also in Germany, uh, they, they are finishing discussion that uh, the state would uh, guarantee revenues to the operators in case that, that uh, the demand for hydrogen would be lower than it was envisaged before. So this is an important step, how to assure uh, investment decision for such an uh, infrastructure. So these are some uh, interesting steps ahead uh, in terms of hydrogen. Thank you for mentioning three steps, uh, which is actually interesting. You mentioned mostly countries like Denmark and Netherlands uh, also northern Germany, uh, so um, countries with absolutely no mountains around. So, so the, 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 probably s there is a problem in, in Slovenia. We have too many mountains, so we're not, we're not so good in, in building uh, the backbone, but it's, it's not true, of course. Uh, Mr. Skender, yeah. Excuse me, ju just to add one from, from Slovenia. Just now, the consortia of Slovenian companies, uh, uh, our company, Plinovodi, among them, is signing agreement with Japanese development agency to, de uh, to develop technology on hydrogen. So this is, let's say, one step, important step. So we, 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 we can actually do it. Some mountains yeah. are, are no problem there. Uh, Mr. Skinder, your vision, what we have in common with Germans is that we like to complain. We actually share, share the, 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 um, the world champion uh, uh, spot uh, when it comes to complaining with, with Germans, but, but we're doing well, both of, both of us. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, uh, okay, your vision. Vision, yeah. Well, I think uh, the desire or um, yeah, um, willingness to complain is not just a Slovenian-German um, trait. I think no? uh, we share it across, across, across Europe. But we're the best in it. But, um, but I would yeah. say that um, complaining sometimes is also useful um, because yep. it does bring, uh, bring to the table some critical, um, critical thinking. Um, and uh, that being said, I think going forward, there are uh, two messages that I would leave, um, leave this room with. One is um, ambition, which was mentioned um, by Lea and Eva. Um, we need high ambition, um, strong goals and a vision. Um, so there is no such thing as not ambitious enough. Mm -hmm. um, but the other one is then being prudent, complain a little bit about what's doable and what's not, and then um, uh, distill um, the execution uh, to come to some solutions that are actually, actually feasible. Um, that being said, um, just a word of warning maybe, we do see a little bit of a tendency to roll back some of the green policies across Europe at the moment. Yeah. I think now it's time to, to stand firm, um, maybe stick to the old, um, old um, Gandhi um, rule of, of destiny when words become actions and actions become habits and habits become values and then we end up living in a destiny. So I think if, if we live up to those expectations that, and uh, let's stay course on the path we've set, um, also the political turbulence will, will be overcome. Thank you for mentioning Gandhi. Uh, there will also be elections in India this year. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, Mrs. Laurish, when you try to look into the future, we, we heard a lot of that we have potential, we have ideas, we have the technology. What we lack is ambition. How would you push this, this ambition uh, to, to um, let's say, sound, sound level we, we all want? Uh, yes, I think that the, the actual uh, potential needs to be estimated for Slovenia. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first step. 
and then, uh, of course, to accelerate the, the production uh, as, as soon as possible, not uh, 2030, but uh, why not act now? The time uh, is now that we assure the Europeans the green energy and uh, the, also to the industry that it can de decarbonize itself. Mm. Uh, there are coming ESG measures that will force the industry to get g greener. Uh, and, uh, of course, yeah, we can uh, assure um, that, that transit would be, would be smooth. Uh, with the strong support and with the conversation of all the stakeholders, stakeholders that are including, uh, included in this uh, very diverse uh, process. But uh, we must, I would also like to note that uh, biomethane production, if we're speaking about the weather, is not weather dependable, it's constant. And uh, it's in the diversification scenarios for renewables, it is a stable source uh, uh, that is produced in a continuous uh, process. Uh, this is maybe what needs to be stressed. So I hope that uh, biomethane will get important spot in, the, in the, the total package of the renewables in the region as well as in Slovenia. Well, good point. Uh, Mrs. Avramiuk-Lete, the last word goes to those goes to you. So in Slovenia, uh, we promise we will uh, not stop to complain, but we will complain, of course, in a very constructive and ambitious <laughs> way, even better than the Germans. We will beat them in that. So, so your your final uh, thoughts. Uh, my final thought. Maybe I start with that. That um, actually, I've learned today that we have a lot of similarities, <laughs> because. Polish people also like to complain. I'm very surprised we are not in, in the leading on, on this with you. Slovenians and Poles have much in common, I would say. But, but uh, we'll discuss this next, next week when the Polish president comes to Slovenia. But, but actually, actually I'll, about the similarities, mm. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing because we can learn from each other. We can learn what is implemented in other countries mm -hmm. and how to do it. Perhaps someone is, has already done it and done it successfully, as we heard in the North. Um, for, for the time being, I see that, uh, for instance, our renewable liquid gases are already inscribed in national energy plans uh, in Italy. Uh, they are going to play a big role, Czech Republic in, uh, in uh, uh, Spain. So th there is already a recognition of renewable liquid gases, although we are quite a niche, mm -hmm. uh, niche, uh, niche product in, 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 in a sense. So I think we could learn a lot from each other. Uh, saying um, leave the door open to to also uh, different possibilities and and uh, bringing this back, but my final final message would be we all need a just energy transition where all fuels play a role, and this is just energy for for everyone and everywhere. Those are people in cities, but those are people also in rural areas, which do need our support. They need uh, cleaner energy sources as well, uh, and and they shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, we need to have a quite a neutral approach towards uh, which type of fuels we use in country basis. Let's just give opportunities for those uh, for, for, for those options that uh, that are already available. Uh, don't don't cross down cross out at this point because you never know in the future you might need someone like LPG to back up <laughs> supply of electricity somewhere. Uh, so I, I would say let's 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 try. To, to, to stay with this, uh, let's say, neutral approach towards, towards the fuels. Um, I am very optimistic, and I spoke to my colleagues in, in Slovenia. Actually, they are extremely optimistic about renewable gases in Slovenia. This is very un-Slovenian. <laughs> are, are you Slovenian? Yeah. Yes. Optimistic yes. Slovenian. So they're, they're, wow. They're, they're, they're optimistic Slovenians, uh, and they're very keen to see what hap will happen in, in um with the energy law, it's going to be implemented, as also the national energy plans. Um, uh, so I, I remain also optimistic at the EU level. Uh, so yes, uh, I believe that you know, let's stay optimistic and and work together. So we have a common goal. We we can learn uh, from each other and make sure that this energy transition is for everyone. Thank you very much. You know, the Slovenians are optimistic uh, when they're not hungry. And that's this is good. the good thing is that, that lunch is coming. But before that, uh, we have the final, uh, final remarks by Mr. Uh, Watson. Uh, so do, do we remain here? You will be... Yeah. I'm not going to take too long. No, 
no, nobody, nobody knows that they should uh, be as quick as possible when you're standing in front of a group of people who want lunch. Yeah. So I've got about uh, 11 points that I need to go through, uh, so I should be finished in the next half an hour. No, I, I am joking. I have to say, first of all, Eagle, thanks very much for the moderation. I particularly enjoyed it. Uh, there is a certain dry sense of humour that comes through, which is very much appreciated by people who are born in a wet country and live in a wet country who like things that are dry. So this sense of humour that you've given us today has been great. Really appreciate the uh, moderation. H humour is a renewable source of energy, you should know. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And I think most people have been smiling this morning. So that's a very good thing. To come to a gas yeah. conference and smile. So, th so thank you for that. Uh, I would say that the link between the panel, and thanks very much to everybody on the panel here, and, and the previous one, is indeed looking at the types of new gases that we were bringing in. Because when you talk about biomethane, you're also talking about security of supply. You make that gas yourself in your own country, which means you're not importing from somewhere else. So that's something that you also have to take as, as a very big positive. And I think of uh, Monica, the European Commission uh, produced these superb uh, biomethane fiches which say, what is the potential for biomethane in each country? And for Slovenia, it's about one, uh, sorry, about 10% uh, by 2030. So it is only a question of finding the right mechanisms uh, to realize that. Uh, and I think that that is something we have to look at. Of course, hydrogen as well. You've all talked about that very uh, importantly. It is another mechanism for security of supply. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, you can make it from the, uh, from the nuclear facilities that you have. We're not against that in Eurogas. Uh, of course, you can also make it from natural gas with CCS in the future. We would also see that as an opportunity. But, uh, of course, you're also going to make it from renewable electricity. And if you are going in that direction, you will certainly have times where you produce a hell of a lot in summer, particularly if it's solar. And in winter, if you're unlucky enough to live in London, you get 1 13th of the power from a solar panel in December that you get in June, you will need something else. Green hydrogen can be a good opportunity. I would also uh, say attention to the first panel, um, not just to think about the biomethane link between the two, that in the region I think we are very positive. We heard very well from the uh, LNG uh, uh, Hrvatska from Crook that indeed fully booked capacity to 2037 but building more. That shows that the area and the region understands that there is a need uh, still for natural gas for some time to come. We will be uh, looking uh, how we can actually make sure that that is a step-by-step -step process. Using natural gas, I think, Mattia, your presentation showed the use of natural gas that is still needed by Slovenia coming up for the next decade, decade and a half, two decades. This is very, uh, very clear. So we have to manage the two things, and they go together. Security of supply, decarbonization, Making the decisions that matter, I think the idea that we all have of technology neutrality is something that we certainly share in Eurogas. We think that you will need an array of solutions, and every country will need an array of solutions. We also need people uh, as well, uh, like you, Leia, who are going to be you know, on the ground and developing the new technologies and, and making them more cost-effective, because, of course, that is the first thing we need to do. But we need to do it in partnership. Partnership with Gregor, partnership with governments, this is clear. Together, we will be able to achieve it. If we try to go alone and not listen to each other, we will struggle. So let us work together, and let us make sure that if we do work together, we do deliver on the optimism that Ava has given us, but also on the realities that we can achieve these things. If the European Commission says it could be done, I usually think that it usually can be done. I must go into the thank you mode, and I must say thank you to the panelists. Thank you, of course, to Igor. Uh, thank you to the first uh, panelists. Uh, to all the keynote speeches uh, from Boyan, from Monica, uh, from Frank, uh, the MEP, and also, of course, uh, to Mattia uh, and Didier for the opening speeches. But uh, I think uh, we must really uh, also remember that all the people behind the scenes, the teams of Eurogas, the teams of Mattia and Geoplan, who have done uh, so much work to make this conference a success this morning. So we must thank them. And finally, I have to thank you as the audience. You have asked questions, even though Igor assured me you wouldn't. So I'm really very happy to see that you have been engaged, that you have smiled, that you have listened. And I hope that what we like to do with these conferences is bring knowledge from around Europe, but also learn about what things are happening here. And that together, we will have that cross-fertilization to find the right ways forward for all of us. And let us say, let's go out and enjoy the sun here in Slovenia. Uh, with smiles on our faces, having had a good uh, lunch following this good conference. Thank you to you all. Let's have another chat over uh, something to eat. You can get up, you need to come down.